my co-chair, Sam Lazarus. And we are deeply honored to welcome you to the 17th Annual Social Enterprise Conference, presented by students from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and the Harvard Business School. We are thrilled that this weekend has finally arrived. But <laughs> before we jump into the two jam-packed days ahead, we want to take some time and share a thank you with, with everyone who has been part of making this possible. First off, we're leveraging the talents and time of hundreds of staff members at Harvard University. Uh, they may largely be behind the scenes, but their tireless efforts don't go unnoticed by us. Uh, we thank them for being individuals that are actually making sure this thing runs smoothly. Uh, to our sponsors, we also say thank you. Uh, their investment in this event is why we're so privileged to do this year after year. And in particular, we want to uh, thank the Harvard Kennedy School Center for Public Leadership, who is incredibly generous with their support. We are grateful to our more than 90 volunteers who will be taking time to move the muscle that keeps everything going. You will be able to spot them because of their orange, safety orange shirts. Please, please feel free to ask some questions in case you need it. We've done our best to keep them up to speed with all of our inner workings, but please do be patient if you have questions. Our speakers come to us from across the public and the private sectors. They've given their time and come here at their own expense to be a part of the Seagull family. To them, we say thank you, and we hope that they find that they can learn as much from attendees as they can teach them. The, the team of 30 students uh, that have been playing in this conference are identifiable by their green hats, say at Team Seacom. Um, they've been our conference's energy since the beginning. Uh, this conference is absolutely a reflection of their passion, drive, and spirit. Uh, it's been an absolute joy for Kyle and myself to work alongside these guys this past year. And, and we don't believe that we could come up with any words at all that correctly capture their efforts. Our final thank you is to you, our attendees, who have come from across the world to be here. We're quite simply humbled to have your attention and your wisdom. More than anything, Seekin attendees come back year after year because of the bonds formed during our short time together. You keep us honest, you keep us going, and for that we are eternally grateful. Now, that all being said, uh, we know that social enterprise is not just about saying thank you. Uh, in fact, if there's anything that we think that social enterprise could possibly use, it's, it's less time celebrating where we've been, uh, and instead talking about where we're going, and how our previous experiences, both the successes and the failures, uh, must influence that path. Um, that's the approach that we took back in April when we started planning this. Uh, we wanted to bring individuals that we know would help us both uncover the absolute truths of social enterprise and also inspire us to dare to make a difference. Uh, to live up to that promise, we have one request of you all, and that is uh, to not be afraid of asking uh, what we see as challenging questions, because we believe that it is through some level of discomfort that we learn and grow. Um, the failure of the past, we believe, demands that we become smarter. Uh, the problems of the future, we also believe, demand that we become greater. The truths and dares of social enterprise are the reason that we choose to be here. So thank you for joining us, and have a wonderful week. Professor Rankin teaches the well-known course, Business and 
as the basic pyramid, which focuses on the promotion of business in developing countries. After this program, we will be a very short intermission. We ask you to come back here right on time for our final two keynotes from Marcus Shingles and Casey Gerald. We thank you for returning on time, but for now, please join us in welcoming Ms. Andrew Jung and Professor Cashman. Good morning to you all, and welcome again to this terrific social enterprise conference. So before we start, let me let you all know that this social enterprise conference, which has been on for the last 16 years now, 17 years now, is planned, designed, launched, executed, everything is done by the Harvard students. So a big, big hand for our students. So let's get started. A warm welcome to all of you on this terrific, terrific day. So, Amber, let me ask you to be introduced with a, such a terrific, smashing career in business, marketing, retailing, and so on. What prompted you to accept the Green America job? Well, good morning. It's great to be with you. And uh, that, I think, is the sort of pivotal question that um, any of us have in our lives. It's sort of uh, at what point decide to um, take the passionate room to do something that is uh, not just enterprise, but socially, socially driven. Uh, and, and for me in America, was that fit for me? I spent uh, you know, decades in, in a wonderful opportunity. I would consider it a privilege and a responsibility kind of rising as a, one of the first women in, in business. And um, the business model itself at Avon was a social enterprise, I like to call it, because the business model was about empowering low-income entrepreneurs to uh, make a business for themselves. And we were operating at Avon in over 100 countries, and it was a global opportunity to, interesting, that the founder of the corporation actually was an encyclopedia salesman, door to door, and there were no women selling at the time, and one Christmas, a friend of his gave him some perfume and said, why don't you see if people who want to buy the encyclopedias want some perfume? And he went knocking door to door, 1886, 34 years before women could go. Everyone who was home were women, and they were saying, we just want the perfume, do we have to buy the encyclopedias? <laughs> <laughs> so the business began. The most pressure thing he did was say, I'm going to give a woman the opportunity to be an entrepreneur, a self-starting entrepreneur. It did not work outside the home. Uh, and the rest is history. But the business model itself was giving low income women all over the world an opportunity to be self made entrepreneurs. And so, in two, after 20 years with um, the passion for seeing what entrepreneurship could do for women, Mama Eunice uh, had approached me to, to take a, a social business, um, a, a technically a non profit. Get it to sustainability and really convert it to a social enterprise and social business across the United States. I myself, um, who had been working as an executive in New York City for a couple decades, thought of and was always inspired by microfinance, microcredit, uh, as an extraordinary social business and social enterprise. I thought it was a very big poverty alleviation solution in the third world, in Bangladesh, in India, in Africa. I had no idea that it had been piloted, and it wasn't easy in its early days, piloted in the United States, actually in the backyard of Queens, New York. Uh, and when I looked at the power, the problem and the power of uh, social enterprise like the Green America to solve financial exclusion for women in this country, it, it was something I couldn't say no to. So, so I mean, then let me ask you, so you make this great comparison between what you did at Avon, 6 million women entrepreneurs, and now Grameen America, 64,000 women? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, all of this leads to women's empowerment, women as micro-entrepreneurs, and so on. 
So focusing on Ravine America itself, can you tell me how these women, 64,000 women, how they have come out of poverty, what are they now doing? Do you have some idea of where their careers take off? Absolutely. Um, let me just first quickly state what the issue is in America, um, which I think is pretty daunting and maybe it's you know, been talked about, so I guess whether you're watching either candidate or met multiple candidates on the stage in these debates, but the issue of income inequality um, and, and particularly the lack of access for capital for women is, is a bigger issue than I myself thought in the United States. Um, one out of three women, nearly 42 million, million women in the United States are living uh, on the brink of or in poverty. 50% uh, of female headed households are unbanked. And in the formal capital loan system, one dollar out of every $23, okay? one dollar out of every $23 is given to women. So that is, that is sort of a startling only 4%. That issue was exacerbated even more in 2008 and 9 with the debt crisis uh, globally, but certainly here in the United States. So the issue is as simple as women are disproportionately disadvantaged to get access to capital for entrepreneurship, particularly at the low income level. The model of Green America is replicated after the Green Bank in Bangladesh. So it is pretty amazing that a solution in the poorest country in the world has been transported to the richest country, and I would argue the richest city in the richest country, and took a few iterations to get it right. So you know, social enterprise is not easy in its early days. But eight years later, today, uh, as you mentioned, we, we actually have, importantly, over 64,000 women and their families who receive microloans. 180,000 microloans have been given out and $381 million of loan capital. And the incredible thing is out of that $380 million, $500,000 has been repaid. Okay, so 99.7% of non-recourse, no collateral loans to women in poverty have been repaid. And this is what the Grameen Bank won the Nobel Peace Prize for in 2006, was that the, the biggest risk target identified by any uh, you know, formal financial capital system uh, with no recourse on the loans would actually have payback rates that the traditional financial system would kill them. So, I mean, tell me, what are the differences to Does the Grammy model works tremendously in Bangladesh, yes. India, and those countries? In the U.S., the application must have been a little more nuanced. I'm sure there are other, other variations to it. Can you just walk us through what those differences yes. are? There are more, there, there's more similarities in the actual structural model itself than you would think. Um, the Grameen model uh, depends on women to get find a group of other women, a group of five women. Uh, I am doing a flower shop. You may be having a food cart or a restaurant business, so we're not getting a joint one, but we are part of a group of women. Uh, and our specific group is five women, but every Tuesday morning, for argument's sake, we meet with, uh, on average, about 29 other women. There are about 30 women that get together in the center. And in that moment is where the social capital of this lending model takes place. Uh, and even with a tremendous amount of digitization that's been required in terms of kind of doing mobile banking, because we don't want our members to be operating with cash, in the United States, we expect that high touch element of the model where there's peer, peer mentorship as well as a peer pressure to repay that loan. And that is, I think, the alchemy and the magic of Grameen. That's very similar to the model, the original model yet in Grameen uh, in Bangladesh. What's different? Uh, the loan sizes obviously are different. It's about 200, started at $27 in Bangladesh, about $200 of the average loan size in Bangladesh today. Our average loan size is 2,200, so it's, it's considerably higher. That is still a pretty low amount. The number one question people say to me is, what can 1,500, which is our first time maximum loan, do in the United States? But our average loan size is about $2,000. Uh, we are not a bank. That's different than Bangladesh. Uh, the Green Bank in Bangladesh is actually a bank that is completely self-sustainable. It takes deposits, etc. We're not a regulated FDIC bank. Uh, but we do have partners, so the two things that we do besides give loan capital to entrepreneurs is we help bank them. So we have banking partners that are formal banks, whether it's Citibank, Wells Fargo, you know, Capital One, who open concessionary, no-fee bank accounts so that our, our members understand the power of asset building and savings. And the second very uniquely United States or American aspect is that we build 
threat. That's not something they focus on in the United, uh, excuse me, in Bangladesh. But we partner with Experian, and in 26 weeks, if you come to Green America with no bank account, no credit, and no access to loan capital, you would get your first time loan, a bank account, but very importantly, you would have a credit score that you pay back every week of nearly 700. So our members uh, have on average the very first six months a 680 credit score, which is a very powerful, powerful and important um, inflection point for them in not just the world of lending, but just cell phones, rent, mortgages. It's a very, very important thing for anyone, particularly women, to establish their own credit. So Andrea, the $380 million, 100% loan repayment rate, New York City, financial capital of the world. So on the funding side, is the funding coming from impact investors who are looking for a return or is it charitable money? It is an interesting evolution. Um, we started off as a 501c3 charitable organization. Never the intention, because those of you who've heard Muhammad Yunus and read Muhammad Yunus know that he doesn't believe in charity for sustainable, scalable solutions. He only believes in social enterprise or social business, he will call it, as an ability to power sustainable solutions. Uh, but because we weren't a bank, and we were just starting off, we began in 2008, primarily funded by charitable donations, uh, like any other 501c3. So we were a microfinance organization fueled primarily by individual and, um, and foundation grants. That's how we began. We very quickly began to see the power of the fact that this could become truly sustainable. In fact, our very first branch operation in 2008 is today uh, completely self-sustainable. We made $1 million of income, interest income, in our Jackson Heights branch, to which more than paid for the $750,000 cost to operate that branch. So, you know, you can look at that branch and say they made a quarter of a million dollars net. Dividend, of course, in our philosophy and our model goes all the way back into the program and that quarter of a million dollars and 100% just fuels more loans to more women. But it is, in fact, self-sustaining. Um, and three other branches of our 18 will turn sustainable this year. So we know we have a model now, and it takes about five years, in our case, takes about 4,000 members and about a $5 million portfolio. Outstanding. And we, in fact, can become a, a, a truly self-sustaining, viable business model. So the actual goal over the next several years on the, business, on the uh, locations that we are in right now is to actually become completely organizationally self-sustainable uh, by 2018-19, which would I mean, it took about 10 years. We will have served, at that point, about 150,000 women and their families, uh, have a, over $100 million of outstanding portfolio, and given out at that point a billion dollars, and basically recouped all of that in cities all over the United States. So that, that is the sort of the social enterprise profitable for the dividend, all the way back into the program model that we see. Of late in this interim period, because we're not 100% sustainable now, we've shifted. So it is about 50 50 philanthropic gifts and 50% um, friendly patient capital. You and I were talking right before coming on about what does that look like? What kind of loans, soft loans, social impact bonds, social impact vehicles of people who want their principal back, want some some, again, return, but understand that that friendly return is that the social good of their investment will outweigh their typical, I'll just call it interest or, or, or repayment. That, that's become more and more on A, palatable, exciting, and interesting to our investors, so we have raised our debt to equity ratio is one to one going quickly to more and more debt and more social impact investors who are looking at this as venture philanthropy as opposed to just outright a handout. And so they understand this handout will go self-sustainable quickly. So, so it looks like in 10 years from now, this will be self-sustainable, which means investors... Two years. Two years. Two, years. So two three. Two to three years from now, That's all the two branches will be self-sustainable. It's fantastic. And so investors can come in, they can get some kind of a social dividend we, we carry on yes. from there.
should all social enterprises aspire to this kind of sustainability? I know you don't microfinance that way. Should all social enterprises in the U.S. aspire to that kind of sustainability? I think so because you know it, it is about how long will it take, and is the vision in the pilot, and then the vision um, does it work? And it is complicated and complex, but. I am one who firmly believes that without scale, we can't really affect the issues. That there, and without sustainability, there's no scale. This probably comes from my for-profit background for you know, decades before moving over into the social enterprise side. Um, you know, as a personal story, I, you know, when, I, when I retired from the for-profit sector in 2012, uh, I had a, 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 a host of opportunities that I would say with my fast no's. They were on the for-profit side. I knew I didn't want to go and work in private equity office with, you know, uh, two days to go play golf and three days to work on deals like a lot of other retiring public company CEOs. But I also knew I did not want to go to work for a traditional nonprofit organization, of which there were many and they are phenomenal. Having the passion I had for women's entrepreneurship and uh, women's empowerment, I can't tell you how many incredible nonprofits there were that needed um, leadership. But I knew that the only thing I could do would be to A, write a check, B, perhaps give them some board advice, but to actually devote my time to something that was just simply a cycle of handouts. Uh, all great amazing, but not, not sustainable, I don't know how I could do that um, as a business person who, who has lived a life of understanding how in order to have a distributed impact of scale, you've got to be able to, to apply business skills and change that center of gravity. So there was no question that I had to find a social enterprise or a social business that could make money with the final dividend going right back into the, you know, the, the social good. And there aren't that many um, yet. I believe there will be far more going forward, thanks to everybody in this room and the next generation is going to knock this and figure it out. But this was one. My okay. credit was one and my skills could help scale it. So it's interesting that you mentioned that. So, so in a way you said that not all social enterprises fit this mold of sustainability going forward and for impact investors to come, but the one you chose, given your business background, clearly had these features, so you jumped right into it. So now let me tap into your business background. A lot of what you've done in business has been with marketing and understanding the customer and trying to evolve your products and services so that it addresses the market need. Is Grameen America like that? How do you bring your marketing skills to bear on this kind of thing? Absolutely, uh, it needs to be like that, but I can give you some examples of where in its early days it might not have been like that. And this, uh, this is what I would just call kind of where is the center of gravity? Um, and there's always sort of polar forces. So if I just stick for a second in the for-profit, you've got the customer and you've got the shareholder. And we could go on and on, couldn't we? <laughs> about that dichotomy and where the shareholder interest and the earnings per share. I lived that for 13 years, 52 quarters of, you know, do you invest in the, in the consumer? What does the consumer want versus what does the shareholder want? So you've got that tension and that center of gravity, if it is wrong, is a problem. Interestingly, um, because people ask me all the time, what's the difference in a nonprofit? or an NGO from a for-profit, you've lived both sides of the equation, even though the missions are actually kissing cousins. I would just say that center of gravity is different. It's not the, you know, it's not the public shareholder, but it is your donor base. It can be your donor base, um, it can be the individual philanthropist who may have emotion, but not necessarily facts. So I can give you some examples in the uh, 18 branches that we have in Virginia America. Uh, in its early days, some of them were open where there was the money, which doesn't mean that's where the, the, the need was, where from a, when you and I went to Turner Marketing, we actually sat there and said, where are women over 18, unbanked, unemployed, where are the deepest areas of urban poverty that we should 
put this program, that's how we would do it as a for-profit business. We would scale based on need, we would scale based on marketing facts. Um, and it's easy to see how in nonprofits, you kind of go where the donor gave you money. He or she wanted this program in their backyard, at their school, at their home. And, and there is a tremendous amount of that out there. And so the centrifugal force to go where the money is, in this case the donor money, doesn't yield necessarily the best pathway to a sustainable social enterprise. So, I mean, we did some kind of crazy things like close a branch and have that conversation and some things that would have been a sort of a for-profit business decision. But we really took a very deep and hard lens to say donor agnostic, funding agnostic, from a marketing point of view, where's the need? What does this borrower need? Where does she need it? Where should we um, apply our programmatic impact to give the best good? And that, that's, a, that's a shift of that center of gravity back to a more marketing slash fact-based analysis of program. And I think that's made a difference. You know, I, I do. I think that um, not easy, it's, it's shifting the, the narrative a little bit, but I think people appreciate it and applaud it because I will say that the issue of going from a sort of typical nonprofit to a sustainable model, that is something that everybody does understand. Um, and if they step back from it, they, they actually applaud that. And it's necessary. So, so that being the case, were there any tensions at all between what the donors and the funders thought their money should do and what you found by being in touch on the ground with what your clients wanted? All the time. Uh, you know, uh, and I, I say this to those in, in, in the room, and some of you are still students, and some of you are you know, out there in, in enterprise, but I think one of the biggest learnings that I've had, nonprofit, for-profit, huge organization or small organization, is that if you don't focus on something, uh, and understand your hedgehog and, and that wheelhouse is really hard. Um, and I think that we had we had this opportunity um, that is so ripe for what I would call you know a bleeding scope. We have 64,000 women who are meeting every single week, okay, um, and they meet every Tuesday morning at seven o'clock, and then at eight o'clock they go off and do their entrepreneurial businesses. And a lot of other organizations, funders, um, and community, uh, you know, advocates would say, at those meetings, every Tuesday morning, why don't we do X and Y? Because you're doing more social good. And, and, and I would say that the temptation, because it makes sense mission-wise, and of course, why wouldn't you? But the, the ability to kind of completely just do something and do it really well, the pull from a priority point of view is always, um, it's always tough. Uh, I, I sit on the board at Apple, completely obviously different than for me. And I remember, uh, I, I remember in some of my earliest days with Steve Jobs when he was still alive, that um, I would say their towering strength was what they said no to. Um, that that the things that they would say yes to could fit products. And there was probably on this little table, and all of the opportunities, which were vast, was almost their pride, was their their no, their no, their no chart. Um, and, and, it, and I have to say, every one of those no's on that no chart was really it's probably a huge business opportunity. I mean, it wasn't stupid stuff that got put up on the sheet of this is not what we're going to do. Uh, but I submit that focus is really hard. It's even harder in a for-profit organization where you're kind of calling the shots, and then you move to a non-profit where you've got somebody who's kind of got a quid pro quo. I'm going to give you the money if you do this because it's a personal interest of mine. Hard to say no to that money. Even harder to say, but we've got to stick to what we're doing. And I, I, I do submit it. I don't take credit because I came in at an inflection point of scale. But the focus just on sticking to our knitting, giving out loans, you know, building, building banking and credit relationships. That's, that's all we did in its earlier years. If we hadn't just focused on that, we would not be sustainable. We would not have a 99.7% repayment rate. And it would have been a lot of good done, but not at an uh, inflection point of a real national impact. So, let me ask you, you mentioned your role on the board of Apple. Apple has said no to a lot of things, including the no that they say now to as well. Yeah. But, but let me go back. I mean, when you started off, you mentioned Avon and the 6 million women who got entrepreneurship to the opportunity to work for Avon as sellers. 
you're on the board of Apple, you're on the board of GE, you're on the board of Daimler. Avon could also be defined as a social enterprise. Would you say the same thing of Apple, GE, and Daimler? Are they a social enterprise? I think um, <coughs> not yet. I think that they are industrial or technology companies trying to find um, and committed in the boardroom as well as you know the management discussion to improve corporate social responsibility. I absolutely think that they, like every other large Fortune 500 company, understand the responsibility of the private sector to, to do their part. How construct-wise, business model-wise they do that, I think everybody's trying to figure it out. I'm a big believer that CSR has to be redefined. Um, look, Apple gives out more iPads and MacBooks to um, K through 12 education in primary schools than, than anyone. They understand the power of technology and the equal access to technology. Uh, how they, again, blend that with their for-profit consumer focus, I think is something that they're, they're paying a tremendous amount of attention to. GE would sit there and tell you that the, the infrastructure that they're building um, in India and in, in Africa is, is, is doing huge social good. But if you just technically understand, you know, our, uh, the definition of social enterprise, um, Unis has a purest definition of social business that is obviously that, that there is zero dividend except social dividend. But if you just move that back to there is social good and, and profit and what is the balance of that. Um, there's a lot more that has to be done in, in corporate America, having been the CEO of, uh, of a Fortune 500 company for over a decade, having been with peers and understanding the, the increasing tension slash opportunity to collaborate between the private and the public sector. I think it's a moment now. I mean, there's no, there's no way we're going to solve the issues without uh, collaboration. There's no way that the public sector is going to solve the issues alone. There's no way that the private sector can alone and NGOs either. So I just go back to the example of microfinance. I mean the government, you know, I'll just say, I, I don't know the government, the issue that I just laid out to you, one out of three women, the unbanked, it's not going to get solved in the next few years by government no matter who's in office. Banks, I understand, it's frustrating, but the big banks, it's not going to be economic to lend to the poor. They're not going to find the economies in the next five years or ten years to give out $2,000 loans with no collateral. Not going to happen. It's inefficient. It's not going to work. NGOs, microcredit, we don't have we don't have a fuel arm We can't get sustainable. We'll have nice programs, but they won't impact that either. So unless there's a collaboration between municipal, state, federal government, the large financial institutions and the NGOs, I submit we're not going to get to where we want to get to. So that that does require a redefinition of CSR. You know, banks have CRA, Community Reinvestment Act, that's mandated. Uh, but move that over to technology companies, move that over to industrial companies, and I say, is there something in that thought of mandated community reinvestment that is beyond the financial sector and goes to the other sectors as well. Because access to capital is one thing, access to technology is another, and access to infrastructure is a third, so access to health. So, you know, this mandated thought of um, investment and how CSR should be approached, I think it's a big topic for business leaders um, and, and should define sort of legacy in the next generation. Fascinating, and uh, you know, I have the opportunity to ask you all these terrific questions. Uh, and you painted us a nice picture starting from a pure social business like I mean, America. Somewhere in the middle is A1 Enterprises, which is not exactly a social business, but it's a social enterprise by which of what it does. And then we have the CSR and the corporation. Then you paint a picture of, of, of this entire ecosystem, how it has to work together in order to improve the livelihoods of everybody in society from the poor to the rich. So let me open it up to the audience so you folks can ask your questions and the keynote speaker can help you out with it. Yes, sir, go ahead. If you stand up and ask your question. Good morning. Good morning, Andrew. David Wilcox, Reach Scale. 
Um, I just heard Professor Yunus speak in Ubli, India, and he, after telling a wonderful story of Grameen Bank, said, but it had zero impact on the financial services industry globally. Um, you've, your tweet, your most tweeted comment, was your comment about no impact without scale, no scale without sustainability. It's all you've been retweeted four or five times. Um, we just announced 17 goals and 169 targets, the world did. I'd like to characterize that as an announcement that the world needs trillions upon trillions of dollars of high impact, modest return businesses. You just described an ecosystem where virtually no one is working on scaled, high impact, modest return businesses. Everybody's working on 20% or more return, or zero return, i.e. nonprofit. So how do we change the ecosystem so that those SDG announcements, which if you went to the launch, you wouldn't hear anybody telling you to move resources to sustainable models. I listened to 130 presentations in New York that week. How do we change the ecosystem so that billions and then trillions of dollars move out of nonprofit and out of only you know, high impact, no high profit, no impact, into the middle ground where most real embedded social enterprises are. Yeah, I think that is the that is the question and the opportunity. You know, I I do believe that there there has to be some policy involved. That's my my to, to, to accelerate. I'll just give you the two examples that I uh, one I just talked about, which is the financial institution having the the requirement, obviously, to put money against um, most of the CRAs used in low-cost housing, but it, it still is, it's, it's still an opportunity to address societal good that would not be where that they would normally put their money for return, it's got less return. Um, I, I'm not one for necessarily saying that the stick versus the carrot works, but I, I think the issue has been bantered and discussed for so long, to your point. I think we've all been to conferences and read about um, the, uh, who can argue it, who can argue it, but I don't think enough is being done about it. Um, and so the combination of requirements uh, and obviously the advocacy and the, the, I think the facts are there. And all I would say is there have to be enough examples of where you can have low profits, but still profits, which is different than no profits. And that is the inflection point we have to hit. Because a lot of great enterprises are still in that lost phase. They just never get out of that phase. You don't have to make a huge profit, but if you can just break even and show that there's the potential, the narrative changes. So finding enough pilot break-evens, as opposed to talking about theoretically the good that this enterprise does, but it still doesn't. If you can't show that you can make money, you don't have to make, just in a small, if, it, if, that, if that starts to change the dialogue, then how do we amass all of those examples and figure out now if we fuel them with not just money but talent. One of the things that, that I'm very uh, hopeful of is that my example is you know what, you can spend your life doing something in a large for profit, and I wish and hope others who like myself would say, I'm going to focus on just trying to prove this now in social enterprise. You know, I have the, the biggest gift I can give to social enterprise is actually my time and experience, right? I mean, so uh, that, that's the, the thing that I can do at this point in my career is say, okay, I understand how to do it and make it, I'm not a profit, but now I'm going to figure that out so that we make a whatever the profit is from social enterprise or I mean, you know, I'm hoping Green America makes many, many millions of dollars by 2022. It's just what we're going to decide to do with that profit is another story. Um, but you got to figure out how to, how to drive a profitable enterprise that then gives the narrative to say it can be done in multiple sectors, with multiple initiatives, and it's time. I, 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 think it's, I think there's the open, people understand, I mean, the issues are so big, unfortunately, right now that they understand they're not going to get solved by the end of yeah. Tough question. I think you got to answer it. Thank you. Other questions? Good morning. My name is Andy Kaplan with DonorsChange.org. Thank you for a terrific presentation and a great story. 
I'm just wondering, Andrea, how do you think about geographic expansion of the marine in America? We're a big country, the need is substantial, um, and you're just starting out. Yes, so we actually had um, some pro bono uh, help from McKinsey in the, uh, at the end of 2013, beginning of 2014, about two years ago, just to that earlier question that I was speaking about, which was, let's, let's just not go where somebody's going to write a big check in the middle of either Omaha or Oklahoma. Let, let's just understand what does the United States landscape look like very, very objectively um, and look at where the model is working. Uh, and we did pilot it, I think, well in a very concentrated way in New York. We are in all five boroughs of New York. Uh, we have 36,000 women and their families served. We've given out a quarter of a billion dollars of loan capital in New York and gotten it all back. So we sort of said, look, and I think this is true for any social enterprise, you have to prove it somewhere. That it took us, it took us, you know, on average about probably six years, five, six years to prove in New York that this is scalable. Whether it's in the Bronx or Queens, we can do this and we can build a talent who understands how to manage it and we can get the economic return and the loans are going to pay and we can do it at scale. There's one million women in poverty in New York. We have set a pretty lofty, actual, tangible goal of 100,000 women in New York. That's 10% of women in poverty. We think that defies a nice nonprofit. We think that's significant impact on a social issue. And we're at 36,000 and growing, so it's not out of reach that we set that goal, which I think is important, and did it really well. You know, I always like to say nail it before you scale it. So what did nail it mean? Nail it means get to some scale in one geographic location, Solve the process issues, because there were process issues, financial controls, technology. People were bringing back $63 a week in 10 and $1 bills. And we were like, wow, if you heard about M-Pesa in Kenya, I mean, we can't take cash back to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars in the United States. But that's what was happening. So we had to go paperless and cashless and figure out the MIS systems and the iPads and the mobile technology to go cashless. Uh, so we sort of said, let's just do that first before we start scaling all over the place. Uh, so I think we nailed it in New York. And now we used some objective information and data about women in the concentration, women in the need, where the financial inclusion was you know, most needed, uh, where there were high uh, you know, instances of rejected from loans, coupled with usury rates, payday lending being their only other opportunity. That's where we should go, and that's how we determined. Uh, so today, now we're we're deeply in California. The research told us go deep, go deeper in New York. So keep nailing it, but you really should get to ten percent of women in poverty. Go to California, uh, and then obvious other places. Uh, that they identified sort of city by city is now our roadmap as opposed to, oh, we had a great donor who heard about it, loved it, wants to write a couple million dollar check. We are actually going to Miami or going, you know, we would go to, we would pick the city and then we would find people as opposed to opening where somebody wanted us to open. That's the difference in terms of the geographic expansion. Other questions? So let me go to the back benches before I get to it. Anybody there? I can see very clearly. Okay. Hello, uh, thank you for yeah, uh, taking my question. My name is uh, Juan from Entrepreneurs Giving Back. You mentioned the center of gravity before and you compared a for profit versus the customer and the shareholder, kind of that tension, and the uh, non profit, which is, uh, I guess, the people who are trying to help in the donors. Yes. Um, is the social enterprise, what their center of gravity, does it shift back to a customer and the shareholder, only the shareholders kind of, in mind, think they're, they know they're going to be making less of a profit and more of an impact, or is the center of gravity somewhere else? Well, I think there's always going to be some center of gravity tension um, that, 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 until you're completely self-sustained. Um, I, I would say that um, Green Bank is probably an example of where They've kind of figured out the center of gravity, it took them a while, but today, um, you know, it's, it's completely self-sustained. There's no need for 
impact investors, there's no need for donors, they self-sustain. Um, as a matter of fact, what I, what I love is that I think that the, there's billions of dollars of, of savings that members are putting in, and actually the savings is outpaced the lending. So they like to say that their borrowers are actually lending to, to the bank, <laughs> that the bank is actually the, is the loan need and the, and the borrowers are the lenders, so they kind of flip the model. But if I just took a step, I think social enterprises have the opportunity to get that, that, that balance a little bit better in play. I think you've got the extremes of your traditional nonprofit and your traditional for-profit, where unfortunately, I think what I think we're saying is that the center of gravity of the shareholder or the donor has its moments of overpowering the mix. In a social enterprise where you're not expecting that kind of profit, 20%, and again, you're not at zero profit, so you're 100% dependent on the donor, isn't a social enterprise that's coming somewhere in between not making as much money but still making money able to kind of switch that center back to um, being able to, to, to be mission-based against those who you want to serve, um, to the issue you want to solve, and yet um, you know, still have the infusion in early years anyway of social capital. I think it's not perfect, but it's, I, think, I think it's going to be the happy ground meeting at least for the near-medium term, never mind social. Yeah, this, this question has come up again and again, so really it's the creation of the social capital market, so robust social capital market has to develop when actually this bridging can happen. And I think that's a challenge. That's a challenge for, for us as a society, and it's a challenge for, in fact, all societies. So let me take this question to the gentleman. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name is Michael. I was just curious, is there any general profile of your client that you would care to share? So for example, New York, I know it's a very ethnic city. You know, how does ethnicity play in terms of your clients? And then also, in terms of the businesses that they create, is there any general characteristics um, sure. about them? Yes, um, so we, today, and you know, we're still in our early years, but we are, um, you know, we are all women uh, in, in poverty, so that, that's number one, poverty defined at the federal poverty level of just over 20,000 per family of four. Our income base of our target is probably a little bit more than, but not much more than half of that, so $15,000 household income, which is obviously extremely low. Our average age is about 40, our average, um, is, is higher than 50% of our single, single-led households with families of two slash three children. Um, highly, highly uh, minority driven, predominantly in, in New York, Hispanic, um, many immigrants. And um, so that, that, that is the profile, but I would say minority women, uh, many female-headed households, uh, and 60% of the U.S. poverty level, not even at the break. That's who today Green America is serving. Kinds of businesses they're doing are interesting because even by city, we're in 11 cities, it's very fairly similar. So 50% services, 50% um, you know product economy. But if I just use service economy, we have about 18% who do food services, and that has ranged from catering services, bakeries, food carts, rest small restaurants. Um, Food services is about 20% of it. Um, we do have a lot. I have to tell you two fast stories that kind of give you an idea of service. One is that uh, you know, we had a woman who was actually a victim of violence. She had sort of the, the courage to leave. She had a very young son. She lived on the F train in the subway for a few days uh, because she was homeless. And a Grameen American loan officer gave her a $1,500 loan voucher. She used that loan to rent a chair in a salon, in a hair salon. So, you know, salons today, they just rent the seats to people who cut hair. She today, it's about two and a half years later, she actually runs the salon. She has three employees. She doesn't have to deal with childcare anymore and as a pressure. Um, she got her US citizenship two days ago and we gave her an $11,000 loan and we've given her today over $60,000 loan capital. 
So that's an example of sort of someone who's sort of taken a small amount, kind of gotten themselves out of a really tough situation and actually proven to be a robust entrepreneur. Um, in the product sales, some of them actually do do some kind of direct sales because there's actually, if you want to do jewelry, you don't have to hire a designer, you be a designer, you just have to understand a little bit about managing inventory. A uh, very important thing is our loans must be used for entrepreneurship. If I give you $1,500, you must use it to fund inventory, working capital, rent for your business. It's not for you know other debt you might have, and you have to prove it's being used for entrepreneurship. But um, we have people in Charlotte who have done extraordinarily creative things on websites and selling inventory. We have people who are, um, you know, have, uh, I met somebody in Jackson Heights the other day who has a shop that really started out probably this big and is now larger than two times this stage, who is um, basically selling special occasion. And she, she bought her, her first one was for a sewing machine. Uh, she started out as a tailor, and today she's got, you know, for quinceaneras and any special occasion of the wedding, she's the go-to designer and seamstress in Jackson Heights, and that, that gets started with a small, in her case, thousand dollar loan for a sewing machine and some thread. So, so I have a quick follow-up question, and then maybe one last question to wrap up the panel. A quick follow-up question is, in Bangladesh, if you take a look at the Green Bank or Prague, or if you take a look at some of the better performing microfinance organizations in India, they recognize that entrepreneurship is a difficult thing. You can give a loan, that's the easy part. The difficult part is these women, they have to go their bakery or their sewing shop or whatever, requires some management skills. Does Green America have any of these support systems to help these entrepreneurs manage their business? And I think it's um, I think it is one of the things that is the opportunity that we have to get better and better at. It's what I would call technical assistance financial training. Um, the earliest financial training we do is actually five days before you get a loan. So if, I, if I'm going to give you a loan, the one thing you have to commit first is 50, five days before you get that money, you have to come to some basic financial training to understand what it is to manage debt, to understand that entrepreneurship is hard. The more important thing you have to commit to is that meeting every week whereby there's peer training. Uh, the number of people who actually might switch a business or learn something more from their peers than from us as an organization is quite powerful. But I think we've gotten to the point now, eight years into the program, that some of our, our very micro businesses turning into small businesses. I and mean, they're really viable businesses. They need more financial training. And how we partner because we're not necessarily going to build that from scratch. There are great organizations who do that. And how we let them you know, integrate with our organization to help certain segmented members who are really moving into serious businesses, don't do business out of their home, have a storefront, have two storefronts, um, have staff, have management, need to do taxes, I mean, you name it, but they need more help. So I think that's a big, that's a big critical opportunity. The good news in the U.S. is we can really see that happen quite quickly, and then they need more. Awesome. So, and let me ask you the last question. I'm sort of looking around in the audience, at least half of them are aspiring social entrepreneurs that are aspiring for terrific careers to serve society, humanity, and themselves, of course. And then I look at you. You spent a considerable chunk of your career in the for-profit side, in the corporate side, made a big name and reputation for yourself, and now you've decided to get into the social business, social level. What advice would you give our young people? Should they start off like you, work on the corporate side, earn their name, fame, and money, and then come to social enterprise? Or should they start off in the social enterprise and go for it all the way? <laughs> figured it out. There were no social enterprise conferences that I can recall when I graduated. I wanted to go to Peace Corps. I graduated from Princeton. Um, it's okay. You like social enterprise. I'm sorry to say that here. I know I have to kind of stop and <laughs> Anyway, I, I went to go to Peace Corps. Um, I went to Princeton and Africa program. And my parents said, you got to go get a job. I'm sorry. We don't have a lot of money. A job and social mindedness uh, were two different paths. It took me too late until um, you know Avon, which I really think the purpose of the work was more social enterprise.
rise in life, uh, notwithstanding even the foundation work that is there. To kind of come all the way full circle back to the deepest, I guess, satisfaction that I've found. But if I, if I were you, uh, and I think it is changing, it, I, and we, meaning leaders of my, I'm, I'm the old school, have to figure out how to make it something that is rewarding, that can attract, retain, and motivate you in this field. And there's a lot of work to be done on that. But there is no way, there is no way that this world can wait for you to go do what I do, and make a lot of money, and then donate your time like I am in your mid-50s. We don't have time. Our issues are way too big. So if you don't go do it, I don't know who's going to do it. The best and the brightest people from this institution, this city, you know, aren't going to go and solve these issues. Trust me, they're not going to get solved. So I'm putting all of my hope in your baskets. I wish I had been sitting here. Um, it's just, I, I love what I'm doing. It's 30 years too late. Did I have a great career? Absolutely. Did, did, I, did it take until now for me to feel like I, want, I am doing what I actually wanted to do? when I was at my most inspired and optimistic point in my life. Yes. Um, and I don't regret it, but I would say the do-over says, how do we figure out? You guys figured it out at HBS. I'm going to try and figure it out as a leader now at a different point generation within you that, you know what? We aren't going to pay. I'll just use an example. We're a banker to the poor. We, we can't just pay non-profit salaries for the rest of time. We're not going to pay Wall Street bonuses. But somewhere in between, how do we create a social enterprise that says, you don't have to do it for two years and then leave. You can do this, and you can change things. Um, and then even if you go into banking after that, you will drink the Kool-Aid. You will understand what the real issues are, which aren't understood yet. So in any case, we're going to win. But as far as I'm concerned, 30 years too late, I do it now. There are, there's enough dialogue about it. There's a lot of complexity. If not you, Ooh. thank you.